Walter, at the, at the end of the French and Indian War, um, you know, the empire, it seems to me, was very prudent in that it, it did two things which, in hindsight, look perfectly normal. Mm -hmm. um, the first is that it began to try to raise some revenue from what it had decided were fairly wealthy American colonies. Mm -hmm. um, and it drew a line to limit the, their westward expansion mm -hmm. uh, to try to prevent an Indian War, which would have been an, an added expense on top of the expenses of what we know as the French and Indian War. All seems very wise in hindsight, but wound up agitating the colonists no end and producing uh, what we know as the American Revolution. Now, the circumstances that brought on the American Revolution were very different in New England than they were in, in the southern colonies. And I, Can you reflect for us a little bit on what was happening in South Carolina, which we don't hear as much about as we do in Boston? Mm -hmm. I mean, the revolution didn't begin and end in Boston. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, was that too, just that too light? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, well, you know, when, when you talk about the end of the French and Indian War, or as the mother country called it, the Great War for Empire, yeah, they were trying to do two things. And it's interesting, there were two major treaties at the end of that war. One was the Treaty of Paris, which ended the war. The other was the Treaty of Augusta, which was signed by the governors of Virginia, the two Carolinas, and Georgia, with the chieftains of the Cherokee, the Catawba, uh, the Creek, and the Choctaw to settle peace in, in the Southeast. Um, you don't hear much about what happened during the French and Indian War in the Southeast, but the whole frontier from Georgia to Virginia was literally ablaze when the Cherokee decided to declare war. Um, so there's a reason why they wanted to have that uh, proclamation line, which is what uh, the English called it, and they actually set up two bureaus of Indian Affairs, you remember, one for the North and one for the South. The one for the South was based in Charleston. But the Carolinians, particularly the South Carolinians, didn't care about the proclamation line. The Cherokee still occupied the North, uh, excuse me, the Southwestern portion of the state. Uh, but it made a great deal to the gentlemen in Virginia and to a lesser extent in North Carolina because they'd already begun to settle or at least claim lands beyond the mountains. Well, it's certainly true. The Virginians were looking, I mean, in 1763, the Virginians were already looking into the Ohio Valley to lands beyond the Ohio River and, and much of the land, the valuable land along the Ohio River in what is now West Virginia and easternmost Kentucky. I mean, they already had their eyes on that land. Mm -hmm. Whereas in South Carolina, I mean, settlement hadn't extended beyond what we now know is sort of the middle of the state. Is that right? Well, it actually had gotten up into the Piedmont, except for that, that southwestern quadrant. Uh, and most of the settlement in South Carolina was different from than it was from Virginia or even North Carolina. But, and that is, instead of coming through Charleston and moving westward, they had come down, the settlers from Pennsylvania and Virginia had come down the Great Wagon Road through the Shenandoah Valley into the Piedmont of the Carolinas, and that was very recent settlement. Uh, some just before the French and Indian War, but a great deal of that came, came afterwards, and so there was plenty of open land in South Carolina, and they weren't pushing up against um, the Cherokee, because the main Cherokee settlements were in South Carolina and right over the mountains uh, in Tennessee. Well, that's a very different situation than you have in Virginia, where the Virginians are already, they're already pressing up against the Blue Ridge, and the proclamation line is, is really just beyond the line of, of, of Piedmont settlement mm. in Virginia, and you already have, a, you know, the Ohio Company and the Indiana Company mm. already established to exploit land beyond the Ohio River, which is land beyond the proclamation line. So you don't have that at all in South Carolina. I wonder, you have all these settlers who come down into South Carolina from Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and Virginia, Maryland, uh, those people have, don't have the kinds of political connections, family ties to people in the Tidewater. And so is there a cultural distinction? Oh, ab ab absolutely. Um, the Low Country elite was a very special place, and it, it, as you know, it was the wealth that, that was the wealthiest portion of the British Empire in North America. And these folks in the back country, for the most part, are Scots-Irish with a few Germans and English sprinkled in. So they're ethnically different, they're religiously different, they're most of them uh, Presbyterians, a few Baptists, but mostly Presbyterians, and you've got a, a very 
uh, elite society, very wealthy society in the low country, both planter and, and merchant class, um, that's really tied to the Atlantic world. And they don't care about what goes on in what they call the back country, even though by the time of the revolution, two thirds of the white population lives in the back country. So we're talking about up the Santee, up the Congaree River, yeah. and the area where we're, say, centered around what is now Columbia. Actually, no, it's beyond that. Even beyond that. Actually, the area around Columbia wasn't settled until after the Revolution. In the, it was in the middle of the state. It went, they came in, those folks came in through the back door, and some folks had begun to go a little bit up the rivers as far as Orangeburg, for example. Right. But they hadn't yet gotten to the, to the Congaree yet. Um, so that they're literally separated by a no man's land. There's nobody there. Uh, and the folks in, who are running South Carolina pretty much are set, they all, they are all in what we now call the low country, about 50 miles inland, no further back than that. And um, very determined folks who are as much concerned about their rights and privileges vis-a-vis uh, -vis the crown, they don't worry about those in the back country. In fact, when the regulators come up, and I know you like the regulators, um, they'll, they'll say on the eve of the revolution, these are old regulators, you know, you talk about no taxation without representation. You've been doing that to us for years. You know, you've been taxing us, but we don't have any representation in the assembly. Well, that's one of the ironies of the of the coming of the revolution. You've got this the back this back country group that the folks in the tidewater mm -hmm. will regard as a rabble. I presume mm -hmm. um, certainly hold them in disdain. They're not oh, well absolutely. educated. Their leaders are not sophisticated, cultured people like the tidewater mm -hmm. grandees. Um, and we would expect, I mean, just sort of, you, you would sort of intuitively expect, if you didn't know the situation, that those folks in the back country, those were the hardy Democrats. Those were the people who would be most in favor of resistance to the British crown. They would be the leaders. Um, they're angry already at the Tidewater mm -hmm. grandees. They're underrepresented in the South Carolina legislature right there. Um, Aren't they a potential, you know, revolutionary crowd? But but they don't turn out to be. They, they 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 don't they don't turn out to be. In fact, as the revolution progresses, and it comes to the the southern colonies, at least the move towards uh, establishing committees, extra legal governments, if you will, begin in South Carolina as early as 1769, and in Virginia and North Carolina shortly shortly thereafter. It's only right as it looks like there's going to be a break is all of a sudden, well, let's have a general meeting in Charleston and invite those boys from the back country to come down and be part of what we're doing. Well, that wasn't, wasn't quite enough. And even after blood's been shed in 1775 in South Carolina, the best that the low country can do is send a delegation back there to say, well, if you, you won't join us, at least you'll um, be neutral. I mean, that's actually what they did, because they were, the low country is living in a situation where they not only have to worry about the British and the Spanish down there in, in Florida, if because they'll that's always a worry. Then they're living in a population uh, tremendous uh, black majority in the Low Country, two to one slave population, a potential revolt. So having that white majority in the back country either help us or be neutral is pretty is pretty important because once you start a revolution. As they say, once you lose the dogs of war, you don't know where it's going to go. The conditions in the tidewater look to me, now I'm not a scholar of South Carolina no. history, they look, South Carolina looks a lot more like a West Indian colony oh. than it does like a New England one. Oh, it, I mean, it, it really is. And I, I think since our, we started in graduate school, that's pretty much become the, the, the norm is to say South Carolina really is a West Indian colony. It was colonized. The first European settlers were Anglo-Caribbean. They brought with them um, slaves who had been in, in the Caribbean, and they s established an economy, an exploitative plantation economy, based upon the Caribbean model. And uh, the only thing they didn't follow was absentee landlordism. Well, where I was going with this is, you know, the Caribbean colonies, and of course, they're dependent on the Royal Navy for mm -hmm. defense. But you know, while they have grievances with the British Crown in the 1760s, none of them are anxious to join in rebellion. Now, quite interesting. I mean, they have their protests against the Stamp Act and so on, but they're not about to join in rebellion. 
Tidewater, South Carolina, all within ready reach of the power of the Royal Navy, um, is potentially um, at great risk in joining the but, revolutionary movement. But they, from the Stamp Act forward, so we're talking 1765 onward, statements coming out of South Carolina, if I just put them down, you would say, well, this has got to be written by Sam Adams. Uh, the Low Country elite was very concerned about, they wanted to run things their own way. And of course, for many years they basically had because governors came and went, the British Empire, until after the French and Indian War. They weren't concerned in London about cracking down on customs duties and regulations and, and that kind of thing. And so these folks, this is where they're like the Caribbean. Uh, I mean, I love them. And they're, and they're, they're swashbucklers, they really are. They're descendants of folks who came out to make a buck and they didn't make any bones about it and don't get in my way. Uh, they're different, I mean, w to me, it looks like they're very different than the Virginians and the, and the Maryland uh, planters who are, I mean, by the eve of the revolution, Tidewater, Virginia is becoming, land is becoming exhausted. Mm -hmm. And really the more money is being made in the Piedmont region or upriver in places mm -hmm. like Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. Washington is a very good example. Um, 1769, Washington abandoned tobacco altogether, decided it wasn't a thing to grow then got into wheat in a big way. Wheat had largely taken over the larger plantations on the eastern shore of Maryland by the time of the revolution. So there's a change in Chesapeake agriculture going on. Those who aren't participating in it are losing out in a big way. They're going deeply, sliding deeply into debt, um, tobacco planters in the 1760s and early 1770s. And so when they, you know, they talk about slavery in, you know, they, they, the British taxation is, is equal to slavery and, and the British are trying to enslave them. Um, they know what being slaves to debt are already mm -hmm. in, in Virginia, these tobacco planters, and um, the revolutionary movement is for many of them a way to resist British taxation, but to resist uh, you know, being reduced to what they regard as a state of slavery by British, the imposition of British taxes at a time when they're already feeling an enormous mm -hmm. pinch, the contraction in the value of the tobacco yeah. market. Well, see, that wasn't happening in South Carolina. The two major crops in South Carolina, rice and indigo. Uh, indigo, of course, is, this is another reason, why did they rebel? They were, they were exporting a million pounds of indigo to, to England, and it was, an enumer it was a special uh, enumerated uh, uh, good, and they also got a bounty from the parliament for producing indigo within the British Empire. Rice didn't wear out the land because every time you flooded the fields, you brought in fresh nutrients. Uh, so, you know, that wasn't a problem like they had it. So the, the rice culture had expanded as far as it could. In the back country around Orangeburg, South Carolina grew enough wheat. South Carolina was actually exporting wheat at, on the eve of the revolution. Um, so its economy is expanding. They're looking into anything that'll make money, whether it's cattle. But here's a difference. In, in Virginia, they're hoping that you know, tobacco can be pressed westward. It can be, you know, they're imagining what tobacco is a crop in the Ohio Valley, certainly in Kentucky, where it will become an important crop when Virginians settle there. Um, rice, and to a less extent indigo, those are, those are pretty confined to coastal regions, aren't they? Well, indigo can go a little bit inland of what, what made South Carolina after the revolution, of course, was the development of cotton, and cotton culture started in the seven, late 1780s uh, after the revolution, and it, that spread um, westward through Carolina and then into Georgia and the, and the Lower South. South Carolina was really the first great cotton state, but that didn't happen until after the, the end of the revolution. I mean, is it true, the, the cultivation of cotton is confined largely to some of the sea islands right on the coast. Well, sea, sea Island cotton is, but with the development of the cotton gin, um, if we throw in a plug for Nathaniel Green, <laughs> maybe on his plantation um, in Georgia, uh, that made the possibility of developing uh, green seed or upland cotton, which has a very tight fiber, and you need a, something like a, a gin to separate the fiber from the seed. Sea Island cotton is so long and silky that you can separate it by hand and it's... You almost it's, shake the seeds out of yeah, Sea Island cotton. Yeah. Um, I want to come back to that point because we'll talk a little bit later because 
the, the expansion of cotton cultivation is something nobody, I think, on the eve of the revolution is expecting. No, see, actually, or ironically, when Carolina was still a proprietary colony for the first 50 years, they had an experimental garden. As I would say, they had a home extension service. And they tried cotton, upland cotton, and it just didn't, it just didn't work. And then 130 years later, boom, I mean literally. Uh, the cotton boom made the first great fortunes really after the revolution. So what is it that when people are pressing into the South Carolina backcountry, if they're not growing, they're obviously not growing rice, some of them can grow indigo. What are they doing in they, the backcountry? Some are growing tobacco, not much. Although around Spartanburg there was a fairly sizable patch of folks growing tobacco. They're basically subsistence farmers. Corn, um, and of course later on when we get after the revolution and Washington's administration and the Whiskey Rebellion, the best way to get that corn to market most profitably is to turn it into whiskey. That's uh, actually something that's almost never talked about. The assumption that the Whiskey Rebellion is peculiar, that whiskey distillation and, and, is, and, and resistance to the whiskey tax is peculiar to Pennsylvania when it, all the way down the Piedmont. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, most of these, guys, these folks who came into the Carolinas, uh, as you mentioned, they were very certainly in terms of class different. They were, they were Thomas Jefferson's yeoman farmers, if you will. They, they, they weren't hard scrabble because the, the land was still good. It's red clay now, but there was about six to 12 inches of topsoil when those folks moved in. So they could clear the land, plant some corn, let the pigs root for acorns and round them up once a year. Um, and hopefully, some of them put in, eventually by the revolution, you've got little settlements with sawmills and a grist mill and, and that kind of thing. Those folks in the back country really weren't, were trying to improve their lives and they weren't interested in the quarrel between the Rutledges and the Draytons and the Moultries of Charleston uh, as to whether or not excuse me, this or that was going to happen in terms of politics and what the governor did. They wanted to, it was America, basically it's the frontier, the American dream. Leave me alone, let me cultivate my land, maybe I'll get, you know, get enough to eventually buy a slave or two and move on up the ranks. But they don't care anything, I mean they never see, these aren't people who are engaged in a consumer economy, so they're not going to see things that require stamps, for stamp I mean, taxes. You, you know, they're probably, if they're going to have cards or dice, which as you know were taxed, they're going to already have them. Right. They're, they're not going to worry. Or they're going to make them. They're not going to worry about billiard tables. You know, um, the backcountry folks do complain when they have to go to Charleston to deal with a legal matter because that's the only place you could do it. There weren't courts throughout the rest of the until the 1770s. Um, so they would have had to deal with a, you know a deed, stamp, or what have you, which we still have in South sure. Carolina, you know. Um, but for the most part, you're right, the stamp, stamp Act, that didn't affect them. They had a grant, they may or may not have registered it. Uh, if it was registered before 1765, they wouldn't have been worried about it. Uh, and of course, once the Stamp Act was repealed, they didn't have to worry about it then, but that was not what they were concerned with. Those folks in Charleston were very concerned. Sure, I can always think of that about it in this way, you can get to the Townsend deeds, um, which are run on paint, paper, lead, tea, and glass. Mm -hmm. Well, the only thing anybody in the backcountry cared about on that list was lead mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> for bullets. They, they, you know, they don't have most of them don't have glass in their windows. Their houses aren't painted. Um, they don't, you know, they aren't writing a whole heck of a lot. And so, you know, they're where the printing press west of Charleston uh, on the eve of the revolution is there one? No, there is not. So, I mean, there's no you know, people aren't printing. And all the things that those duties are are on. Those don't affect the lives of ordinary people in the back country. Well, you know, see, that's where an older historian that you and I grew up with was, you know, Carl Breidenbaugh. Right. Uh, and the revolu he centered the revolution in the urban centers, and that, there's a lot to be said for that. Although later on you do have others join in, but I mean, you've got, in Charleston you've got three newspapers. The pulpit is important in terms of spreading things. Uh, that is the connection with the Atlantic world. So, and, and it's that's I think that's really important for students of the Revolution to grasp, because I mean we all I mean to reach it back to a historian we didn't grow up with, but you know our fathers and grandfathers grew up with. Um, you go back to Frederick Jackson Turner. You would ex you expect if you're a Turnerian for people on the frontier to be the most 
democratic, the most egalitarian, and therefore, one would imagine, the most apt to support the American independence movement. Yeah, and in their own communities, they were, but their community was different from the community in Charleston. Right, whereas the folks on the, uh, in the Tidewater, who in, in this sense, they, they are like folks in the Tidewater, Maryland and Virginia, and they bear comparison to people in New York, Philadelphia, mm. Boston. They're sophisticated, cosmopolitan people. They're well aware of what's going on in London, the Metropolitan Center. They get ready, regular news. They have regular newspapers. They're participants mm -hmm. in this broader imperial conversation. Uh, and, and they, you know, these events that are taking place in London matter to them, not because they are new man Americans in a sort of a ternarian sense, but in fact because they are active political participants in the political culture of the broader British Empire. And, and you know, it's, uh, I'll, I'll just give you two examples out of South Carolina. South Carolina sent, you know, there was no William and Mary, College of William and Mary, as there was in Virginia. South Carolina sent her sons, the educated elite, to England. They went to Oxford or Cambridge. More young men were trained at the ends of court for the law than all the other 12 colonies combined. And if you look at the white population, South Carolina is very small, and if you narrow it down to the low country, it gets even smaller still. But in terms of the theory of equality and the rights of Englishmen, South Carolinians got involved in that in an interesting way in 1769 when John Wilkes criticized the King's speech from Parliament and got thrown in jail. Well, when a politician gets thrown in jail today in the 21st century, somebody, a friend establishes a legal defense fund. Well, South Carolina, Commons House of Assembly, appropriated a very large sum of money, about 10% of the total defense fund, to John Wilkes to protect the rights of Englishmen. And of course, when the imperial authorities found out about this, they just went, you know, bananas and said, you can't do it. And the House said, well, we've already appropriated the money and transferred it, what you're gonna do? So instructions were sent back to the governor to begin to curtail the powers of the assembly uh, but first they had to say they had done wrong with the uh, funding of Wilkes Fund. They said, we're not going to do it. So we really trace the onset of the decline, almost the absence of royal government in South Carolina from 1769 to 1770. And it's because they were involved in an imperial debate of well, what were the rights of Englishmen. And this man had been thrown in jail for speaking his piece and daring to say the king's th speech from the throne was a bunch of baloney. Uh, Imagine what, if, if that was enforced in this country today, the members of the Congress who would find themselves thrown into jail for criticizing the president. You, you paint a picture of a low country elite which is intellectually sophisticated, participating in this broader uh, imperial debate, very much attached to the rights of Englishmen. Yes. But they won't embrace or tell me if they do. Well, they won't embrace natural rights philosophy like their northern brethren. I mean, they're living in a, in a colony, then a state, with a black majority, which is different than anybody else. Uh, and that, that means, so natural rights theory, has, there's a lot more at stake for South Carolina than there is for Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. And, and when they talk about the rights of Englishmen, they really are more than one South Carolinian referred to the Low Country as our little world, and in our little world they would debate those rights, but they're not talking about the folks who live in Orangeburg District or Spartan District or New Acquisition or in the Waxhaws and places like that. Um, you know, in fact, and they're not talking about the black slaves that, that among oh, whom they live. No, and they're not even really talking about. Uh, the artisans the son, who would become the Sons of Liberty in Charleston, they were very, you know, they were great to have to put mob in the streets p to drive royal authority out, but after the revolution, man, they clamped down big time. Actually brought out the artillery to put down them. Yeah, even more so than, than their Massachusetts brethren in suppressing Shays' Rebellion. There's this wonderful story, you know it, I'm sure better than I do, sorry, where in, in which uh, uh, William Rutledge, there's a, a man who says something naughty about him. John, I'm sorry. Tell the, you know this it's, story. It's, 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 it's John Rutledge. Okay. And the man was 
brought before the bar of the of the General Assembly for disrespect. Uh, for and contempt of for the contempt, General Assembly. Contempt of the General Assembly for daring to criticize. A, 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 I, think, I think he said this man was a plain tavern keeper who said that he would accept the word of a slave over Rutledge. And, and he said this in a private conversation overheard. And this was, it had no, nothing to do of officially with the business of the, of the assembly. And yet he was brought, he was held to be in contempt because Rutledge was offended by what he had. I mean, that's a seem emblematic of a culture which is run by its grandees. Yeah, well, th there's, there's, there's no question about it. Um, and it, and it was very openly until through the Civil War. And does do the do the people in the backcountry as the backcountry fills up? Mm -hmm. it doesn't fill up until after the generation after the Revolution. How is it that people in the backcountry of the Carolinas become politically empowered? It has to do with a very ingenious device that was made a constitutional amendment in 1808, where they decided that the representation in the House of the General Assembly would be, 50% would be apportioned according to population, voting population. 50% would be apportioned according to taxable wealth. And of course, two thirds of the taxable wealth is in human property. Right. But eventually what happens, um, it doesn't get to be so much a backcountry, low country as it gets to be a black belt, white belt. On the eve of the Civil War, only 10 of the state's districts have a white majority, and those are very, some of them are very, very small. So as the black belt, and that was a term that they used in 19th century, as the plantation culture and large slaveholding expanded, uh, things began to change. Uh, so it's, uh, it, I, but this has to do with a class system because we had, South Carolina had property qualifications for office holding until 1865. Walter, is it fair to say that the South Carolina revolutionaries, the grandees mm -hmm. of the low country who participated in the revolution, that they were fighting to maintain the status quo? Yeah. Uh, well, if anything, they wanted a little bit more personal power in terms of running the show here in South Carolina. They, they, they really, they weren't fighting, for, they were fighting to keep their status quo, to keep their power, right. which they did. I meant at home, definitely. At, at home, yeah, at, yeah, at, at, at home. Um, and as I've told my friends in Charleston, and so it's not a surprise, that yes, the revolution began and ended in Charleston, but it was one in the back country. That's absolutely true, but it's, it's a vast contrast between Virginia and South Carolina in this regard. Because I think the Virginians who are leading the revolution, uh, they tend to come from the Piedmont. Mm -hmm. They're not people from what is the equivalent of the low country, the oldest settled parts of Virginia. That tends to be Tory Virginia, mm -hmm. the folks right near the Chesapeake Bay, at the mouths of the rivers. Those, those you know, they're mixed the areas, the areas there. But um, it's, it's people like Washington and Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson, people who lived in what had been the back country in 1720 or 30 of Virginia, but which is a well-settled area by the eve of the revolution. Um, those people are looking further west. They already live beyond the fall line, so they're, they're, they, they can't take advantage of being on you know, lowland rivers, and easy mm -hmm. access to trade. And so they're looking westward uh, beyond the mountains, into the Ohio Valley, into Kentucky. And the revolution for them, on a practical level, is fought to, is to change the nature of the game, to empower them, to let them, you know, they, they, they're ambitious to become, you know, to, to, to acquire landed property in larger estates beyond the mountains. And you see this Washington is extremely acquisitive. Um, after the French and Indian War, buying up land claims along the Ohio River, which he expects to be settled in his lifetime. Now, they, most of them aren't, um, but that's not because he, he, you know, he didn't well, want them to be. Well, see, there, there is the, one of the real differences, too, is that the southwestern portion of South Carolina, present-day Greenville, Oconee, and Pickens County, was still Cher literally Cherokee territory, very heavily settled Cherokee territory those Revolutionary War land grants 
after the Cherokee were knocked out in the early years of the Revolution, that's where South Carolina was issuing their land. Their, their expansion territory was still within the boundaries of, of the colony. When Washington is getting land grants before the Revolution, those guys are looking at Ohio, you've got people like Henry Lawrence, who would be president of the Continental Congress. He's taking out tens of thousands of acres of land grants in the back country of South Carolina. He's not going beyond the mountains. He doesn't have to worry about doing so. He can take care of his second and third and fourth sons without pressing on the frontier. Yeah. Well, see, South Carolina doesn't have primogeniture. They but they still, they still have to provide for their sons. So they're yeah, going to divide they, the yeah, estates. Yeah, they're they, going to get smaller they, they smaller. Have, they, have, they have to provide for their sons. But because those who had it had so much, that really wasn't all that difficult to do. Uh, it was not unusual for one of those, those rice grandees, and I think that's a, an excellent term. Uh, in the con Constitutional Convention, they called them the nabobs of South Carolina, but that's okay too. Uh, they might have four, literally four or five plantations. So give, even leaving a plantation complete with slave force to a daughter was not, was not uncommon. Um, so th they, it's, it's hard to imagine how rich they were. And I, I know you and I both have laughed about Alice Hanson Jones and her wealth of a nation to be. Well, when she lists that table of the 10 richest Americans on the eve of the revolution, nine of those 10 are South Carolinians. The wealth that they had was greater than many countries in the world today, if you, if you make it in constant dollars. It's extraordinary. I mean, you look at revolutions anywhere in the world in the last 250 years to have a, you know, the wealthiest class mm -hmm of people who live in any area to, to not only join, but be it the principal leaders of a resistance, a revolutionary movement, which is so much at risk. Um, that part of the story is, is really quite extraordinary for well, South Carolina. Well, well, it is. And, you know, it's, at one point people used to say, well, low country was predominantly this or the back country that. It was all, it was all mixed up. Some of your strongest bands of Tories are going to be Back country, German backcountry settlers. Right. Uh, but you look at Rutledge's and Lawrence and Gadsden and Moultrie. Uh, these people have a lot to lose, and yet they're the ones who are sticking their necks out. Yes, there's some there's some rich folks in South Carolina who who are who are Tories. The Loyalist transcripts are a fabulous document. It's it's a cross section of the population, so. It's, it's a story that, as you say, is not often told. If you had everything to lose, why would you put it on the line? I mean, it's, and it's not wealth you can transport. I mean, if you own six plantations in, in the low country and you've got, as some of them did, two or 300 slaves, it's not like saying, okay, I'll transfer my money to the Bank of London and it'll be safe. It's not going to be safe, and it wasn't. The British walked off with 25% of the labor force in South Carolina. Um, let, I want to move forward because this is, I think, really important to understand the, the conclusion of the revolution in the South. Um, you've got a really powerful anti-slavery movement beginning in the North, and we can exaggerate it a lot because we look for its origins when we, when we teach about this period. Um, but you could Hamilton and John Jay and Benjamin Franklin. These people are very active in abolition circles in the North. Um, now they tend by 19th century standards to be moderate abolitionists. They're looking forward to the gradual abolition of slavery in most cases, um, prudent uh, compromises which will lead to the end of slavery. Um, and there are modern scholars who argue um, that when slavery was discussed in the Constitutional Convention, and it kept coming up in different ways, mm -hmm. um, that a large number of the most active members, the most intellectually aware members of the Constitutional Convention, were convinced that the abolition of the slave trade was the key compromise that would lead to the gradual abolition of slavery. Now, and we know that that's not, that didn't happen. Um, but slavery isn't mentioned, slaves aren't mentioned, by name at any point in the U.S. Constitution, which suggests to me that everybody present agreed that the institution was not something that wanted that they wanted to uh, embed in the fundamental. 
Well, I, I, I think you're right. And actually, there were, um, in, in this case, uh, the, the South Carolina delegation, who were amongst the most active, were pretty bold in their statements. If you, know, you mess with slavery, you can have the union without us. And, and I, think, I think even, you know, Hamilton and Franklin and others, they recognized that there was absolutely no way to forge, if, even if they wanted to do it. I think some of them did want to forge a constitution without slavery, that they, it, it was a dead letter, that the Union would not be formed without slavery. Um, but was it, a, was it, how common do you think it was, this belief that if we end the slave trade, the slave population will, A, will decline, and B, uh, slavery doesn't have much of a future in the South because the crops that we grow now, now being 1787, they're not really crops that you know, we're gonna grow in the future in what will become Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Missouri. Um, that is, they don't have much future in the, in the inland. And certainly rice doesn't have any future beyond where it's already no, being grown. No. And, and they're pointing to Virginia, the failure, of, you know, the decline of the tobacco and, and right. the Tidewater is maybe slavery, this is one of those things, I think everybody's kind of hoping it's just gonna die a natural death, if, right. if you will. And interestingly, one of the tensions that remained until that 1808 compromise in South Carolina was there were people in the back country after the revolution, particularly Baptists, some Methodists, um, who were very strongly anti-slavery. Uh, the old Methodist discipline until the 19th century, you couldn't be a Methodist clergyman and own slaves. And you had a few congregations in, in the back country saying they were anti-slavery. Anytime you mention that, the folks in the low country just, you press the hot button. I mean, it, it was uh, the pamphlet warfare that went on between the two parts of South Carolina until 1808 were pretty, well, they make for very interesting reading today, but they were you know, each one was talking about, are we gonna to go to war with each other over? But there are people in the low country, mm -hmm. big slave owners, mm -hmm. who are prepared to go along with the abolition of the slave trade. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Why? You know, the Great Compromise, you've also got the two thirds. Well, you have, you, yeah, you do get their vote, you get to count them for the purpose of enumeration. Well, yes, it, it, you know, and, and, and as you well know, the irony with people uh, like Mr. Gary from Massachusetts talking about, well, if, if you can capture slaves, why can't we count our cows and mules? Um, which was not a very nice thing, but that was the, the South got to count. And the, in this case, it, it really, Virginia's part of it, because they're gonna benefit from the two-thirds rule, but where you count an enslaved person, it's two-thirds of a person for representation in the House. But it's really gonna benefit, South Carolina benefits more than anybody else because of their overwhelming black That's population. That's true, That's true. Do, the, do the low country planners, are they prepared to go along with the, the abolition of the slave trade because they already have such a large slave population and, and it will in fact increase the value of their slave property? No, no. If, if you cl close off the the incoming supply, that that didn't really enter into it. But, well, of course, it, it's an 1807 deadline. They've got a certain number of years to to bring slaves in, and one of the things that got South Carolina into economic trouble in the 1790s is after having lost 25 percent of the slave population to the British, either through being hauled off or they just disappeared, maybe into Spanish right. Florida. Uh, Planters went, oh, I had 200 slaves before the revolution. I need 200 now, so they buy them on credit, and then the world economy goes into a dip, and South Carolina's economy tanks. Uh, but there was that mindset, and of course, after 1807, Virginia planters make a lot of money selling their slaves down south. But, but that's, a, that's, that's an after-the-fact look at it. Yeah, they do, but what I, what what, the difference that, I, that puzzles me about mm. the Upper South and the Lower South, the, the Virginians, the Marylanders, they recognize that, that the, the economic world that they've lived in before the revolution 
is coming to an end. At least the intelligent ones do, like Washington. And they're looking forward to a different way of making a living. And so, and so Washington is much more interested in economic diversification. He's interested in harnessing the Great Falls of the Potomac mm -hmm. to, to the water wheels of the Industrial Revolution. He's interested in developing canals for trade. He's, he's interested in crop diversification. And it seems to me, now I'm an outsider to South Carolina history, that, that the South Carolina grandees are, they're, they're comfortable with what they're doing. What, is the, what do they imagine the future is going to be? What is South Carolina going to be like in 50 years? I mean, Washington has a vision of Virginia, what it might be, and it doesn't become what he hopes, but what Virginia would be in 1830 or 1840. Do South Carolina leaders of the revolution have a vision of the future of South Carolina? Not in the same way. Not, not, not in the same way. You, I mean, you obviously have some individuals, and if you trace Washington's tour in the 1790s, he will mention certain South Carolina, or any, wherever he goes, who is, who is a scientific farmer. Right. Uh, and there are, there are some, but South Carolina chooses pretty much the agricultural model, very anti-business, never had an incorporation law until after the Civil War. That's amazing. Um, you know, and even though it becomes the leading cotton state by 18, in 1820, all the cotton shipped to New England to be made into cloth and then shipped back down right. south. I mean, nobody anticipates, I mean, certainly before the revolution, but even in as late as 1788, 89, nobody anticipates the cotton revolution. No, that, that was, that was, nobody saw that. Nobody saw that one coming. Uh, gosh, I can remember a while back as an undergraduate, somebody arguing in our history class at Davidson that it's all the fault of Eli Whitney. It's all at Yankee's fault. It's, 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 all, it's all Eli Whitney and his Yankee invention of the cotton gin, despite the fact that gins had, like that had come into existence elsewhere. But that did make what was a not profitable crop, because people had tried, you try to sit there and pick the seeds out of upland cotton, and you end up with more lint having to be discarded attached to the seeds than you, than you do uh, that you, can, that you can market, and all of a sudden, you've got a crop that any yeoman farmer can grow, and this is, this is what transforms South Carolina's backcountry, or as they would then call the up country, middle and up country, into plantation territory. Because, you know, in three or four years, you could get back your investment on a slave, and then you could buy another one, and another one, and another one. Um, with the exception of one district in 1860, there was at least a planter who owned 100 slaves in every district of South Carolina. An ordinary cotton gin, in, I've, I've done some work on this, an ordinary cotton gin in 1800, mm -hmm. operating mm -hmm. in South Carolina and Georgia, could gin more cotton in one day mm -hmm. than a single worker could clean by hand mm -hmm. in two months. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that transformed that crop into a, into a kind of nuisance crop in a lot of ways. I mean, it really required way too much hand labor into a, a, an engine that drove the economy of South Carolina and then later yeah. Georgia. And the well, and see, for planters who had been into indigo with the end of the revolution, um, of course, they lose the bounty. Right. But also, it's the beginning of chemical dyes being developed for the textile industry. So indigo in the 1790s disappears as a major cash crop. It's still grown for domestic use because it can grow on the uplands. But the rice market, it's not just the British Empire now. You can ship to anywhere. You know, Italy's a big rice market, Spain, Portugal. Uh, so rice looks like its future is going to be there forever. It begins to dim in the 1850s with rice growing in Burma and India as part of the British Empire, uh, competition for American rice. But in, in, the, in 1783, the future for, you know, we'll rebuild the rice, and they were already beginning to figure out how to do it on a large scale with the development of uh, using the tidal flow of the rivers to flood the fields, very ingenious methods. Um, you know, literally, if you fly over the low country today, you can see miles of these old rice dikes 
st and berms still there. And so in the 80s, there was an effort to push that rice cultivation a as, as far as you could go. A as, far, as, as, far, as far as you could go. Um, and it varies with the river. Uh, you need that tidal flow to be able to push right. the, the fresh water and yeah. the fresh water in. Yeah. Uh, uh, but no, they, they thought that they were going to really try to recreate or restore their world, and to a certain extent, they did in terms of agriculture. The big difference was instead of Charleston being the port once cotton came in uh, that would go directly to London, the cotton markets changed and you shipped cotton from the Carolinas to New York, and then it went to, or it was either used there or it was then shipped to London. So Charleston declines as an Atlantic, a major Atlantic port in the years after the revolution. And this is this has world implications. I mean, I mean, the, the, it's not only the invention of the cotton gin, but the the automated looms and uh, that that the British are developing just at the moment. I mean, it's, it's one of the history's great and in many ways tragic coincidences mm -hmm. where the technology to exploit cotton uh, came in in the 1780s and 90s at just the time when you know the American Revolution opened up all this enormous interior of the South. Which and, 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 and where the cotton culture spread into Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana, right. particularly if you go through upper Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, the, the land is so incredibly rich. Right. Um, in, in the debate over nullification and the tariffs, uh, a South Carolina politician uh, jibed at Calhoun and others and said, you may nullify the tariffs, but you may not nullify the soils of Alabama and Mississippi. It was an economic argument. In South Carolina, the topsoil was six to 12 inches, and then it disappeared after about five years. Right. That topsoil in Mississippi and Alabama and the Black Belt and the Delta is six to 12 feet deep. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so, um, you know, geography does have a, have a play in history. Um, and all of this is a, you know, these are, these are the unanticipated consequences of the revolution. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you wouldn't have had the, the ferment um, that led to these economic changes. Eli Whitney wouldn't have come south. Mrs. Green wouldn't have had a plantation for him to be. Every, the entire story um, could have been entirely different. Um, Britain could have gotten the, the cotton to drive the, the looms of the Industrial Revolution from India. They tried, and, uh, but Southern cotton turned out to be much more economical. Um, the, this, this, is a, this is not a story that is peculiar, I think, or, or provincial in any sense, transformation of South Carolina in this era. Well, now, you know, we've talked a lot about the grandees, and I just want to jump back a minute to the proprietary period. South Carolinians in the Revolution referred to their forefathers in 1719 who had overthrown the proprietors. North Carolina didn't take part in that, but South Carolina, they actually had a coup d'etat and asked the royal government to come in. And the men of 75, 76 referred to 1719. And when you get to 1860 in South Carolina, they use the same language and they refer back to their forefathers of 75, 76. So you've got three different periods in South Carolina history going back to that elite asserting its right to control its own destiny. It's an extraordinary story. Thank you for sharing your expertise about this with us. Um, it's a complicated story that, you know, is vital to our understanding of the American Revolution. Um, you know, we need to understand the South Carolina and the revolutions we do, Virginia and North Carolina. Um, you know, the story of the, of, the, of the American Revolution has been dominated by the you know, study of what happens in Boston and Philadelphia and to, a, to some extent in Tidewater, Virginia. Uh, it's a bigger story than that. Well, you know, it, it, ac it actually is. And, you know, I think probably the best cartoon, as you know, to come out of the debate over the power of, of taxation was the ladies of Edenton, North Carolina, and their tea their own boycott of, of tea. Uh, you know, yes, there is more to American history than just what happened in, in New England. That's fine, they can have, but it's, it's all part of the bigger picture, and it's a very complex picture. And a fascinating one. Thank you very much. My pleasure.